Even though television broadcasting has evolved from analog to digital, one thing has not changed since UHF's debut in 1952. There has never been a station on Channel 37. Have you ever noticed it? That channel, in fact, throughout its history has always transmitted only a static signal. But the most interesting thing is that even today, many people believe that the reason for the failure to assign the frequency to some TV station, despite the presumably great demand in the chaotic world of commercial telecommunications, is closely related to the existence of aliens. Don't believe us? Keep watching. We might change your mind. Why Channel 37 doesn't exist and what it has to do with aliens? Even television has its own story worth telling, especially if it offers points of interest also related to the history of radio astronomy and mass psychology. Let's not be intimidated by the technical terms and try to find out together. Bandwidth for television in the United States was allocated by the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, in 1937, solely in the VHF, very high frequency band across 18 channels. American television broadcasting began experimentally in the 1930s with regular commercial broadcasting in cities such as New York and Chicago in 1941. Efforts at TV broadcasting on any channel were drastically curtailed once World War II began, due largely to lack of available receivers. The end of the war brought rapid expansion in the nascent broadcast television industry. 13 VHF channels was found to be insufficient to support the desired expansion of broadcast television across the United States. Interference and channel crowding in densely populated areas, such as the eastern mid-Atlantic states, was a particular problem. So 1952 was the year that the FCC opened up the television system to use UHF, or ultra-high frequency signals. The practical effect of this addition of bandwidth was that the total number of potential TV stations increased dramatically from 108 to 2051 overnight. The first UHF applications were granted on July 11, 1952, and the frequency corresponding to Channel 37 that of 608 to 614 MHz, was assigned to 18 locations in the northeast, grouped in an area of a 1,000 km radius, in which there were cities such as Danville, Illinois, Chicago, Detroit, Milwaukee, Atlanta, Minneapolis, Pittsburgh, St. Louis, Toronto, and Washington, D.C. For all intents and purposes, a 1,000 km radius from eastern Illinois covers the entire east coast except the state of Florida. However, for reasons that are not always clear, this band was never given to many television stations that requested it at the time. The state of affairs continued until the end of the 50s, when the situation began to be further complicated by an unexpected fact. In 1959, in fact, the University of Illinois was completing at Danville the construction of the first large radio telescope of those times. But here it is worth stopping for a moment to talk about it in more detail as well as spending a few moments talking about the growing importance in that period of radio astronomy research. The Vermilion River Radio Observatory VRO, was a research facility operated by the University of Illinois from 1959 to 1984, featuring a 120-meter linear parabolic radio telescope. Located near the Vermilion River, the site was about 72 kilometers from the university campus near Danville, Illinois. Work began in 1959. Once the natural ravine was shaped, it was covered with asphalt and wire mesh, forming a reflector aimed by the Earth's rotation to sweep the sky. A wood trestle 47 meters high was built at the reflector's focus to carry the receivers. The array was configured to allow phasing adjustments to sweep 60 degrees of the sky. The facility was suitable for conducting survey work over large areas of sky but could not be used to study specific targets. The array mapped a significant portion of the Northern Hemisphere sky, allowing the compilation of a catalog of astronomical radio sources. The most notable source discovered by the VRO is Active Galactic Nucleus VRO 42.22.01, the prototype for BL Lacerti objects. Hang on a sec before we continue. Don't forget to join the Insane Curiosity channel click on the bell, you will help us to make products of even higher quality.
The science of radio astronomy was discovered by accident back in the 1930s when a Bell Laboratories engineer, Carl Jansky, was trying to identify sources of interference to long-distance wireless telephone circuits. Using the rotatable antenna shown at right, Jansky identified three sources of interference – local lightning storms, the aggregate of distant lightning storms, and a persistent but variable source that came and went on a slightly less than daily rate. When Jansky plotted the direction of this variable interference, it coincided with the plane of our Milky Way galaxy. Observations over several months in 1932 to 1933 confirmed the result and radio astronomy was born. While Jansky's result was of academic interest, there was no commercial reason to pursue further observation, and the science of radio astronomy languished. Even astronomers didn't follow up. Grote Reber, an amateur radio operator and an employee of a radio company, had read about Jansky's discovery and, beginning in 1937, took it upon himself to further investigate the nature of cosmic radio emissions purely as a personal effort. Jansky and Reber's observations were only the tip of the iceberg, as they were able to detect only the very strongest astronomical radio emissions. The bulk of radio astronomy observing deals with much, much weaker emissions. As a result, radio telescopes are extremely sensitive to interference from adjacent channels. The array of Vermilion River Radio Observatory was optimized for study at a 49-centimeter wavelength equivalent to a frequency of about 610 MHz, coinciding with UHF Television Channel 37. Observations at these frequencies are made primarily of hydrogen atoms, the most prevalent atoms in the universe. Radio frequency emissions from hydrogen atoms fall nominally at 1420 MHz, but because of the expansion of the universe which creates a Doppler shift of spectral line emissions, astronomers observe hydrogen emissions at frequencies lower than this as well, so that the scientists immediately realized that if the FCC granted permission for commercial transmissions, their radio observations would soon be endangered by radio interference in that very specific band. When construction had begun, television was still in its infancy, and not every TV could actually access UHF signals, but soon the UHF shifted from optional upgrade to standard feature on televisions which meant that this radio telescope would be destined to suffer any kind of radio interference. On behalf of the entire scientific community, it was radio astronomer Charles Seeger who lit the fuse of controversy, earning this article in time on May 10, 1963, which first reported the problem. We should have started shouting back in 1947, says radio astronomy Charles Seeger, but we didn't know then what we had hold of. Anxious to make up for this admission, the University of California scientist was in Washington last week shouting as loud as an amateur lobbyist can, crying for control of a tiny band of frequencies, 608 to 614 megacycles, on the electromagnetic spectrum. Commercial television men call that band Channel 37, and they long to fill it. Radio astronomers want it kept clear of all interference so they can listen in peace to the whispering radio waves that come across it from the depths of space. Until a few years ago, the young and exciting science of radio astronomy had the ultra-high frequency part of the spectrum, which includes Channel 37, mostly to itself. Only a few TV stations sullied its waves, and their interference seldom bothered the comparatively crude early radio telescopes. But now the US television industry is about to bulge into UHF, and modern radio telescopes have become increasingly sensitive. They can listen to exploding galaxies near the mysterious edge of the universe, but the slightest interference puts them out of action. A signal from a TV station thousands of miles away can be reflected off an airplane, or a satellite, or even a layer of air, and reach a radio telescope far over the curve of the Earth, with enough strength left to knock a delicate recording needle right off the scale. To get an accurate, uncluttered view of the universe, Radio astronomy needs at least one UHF window that is not blocked by scattered TV chatter. And if the FCC keeps Channel 37 clear of commercial broadcasts in the US, the International Telecommunications Union, which meets this fall in Geneva, is likely to do the same for the rest of the free world. And from this article started such a campaign in favor of the request of radio astronomers that soon the Federal Communications Commission was forced to give up its arms. On October 4, 1963, in fact, 
the FCC adopted a 10-year moratorium on any allocation of stations to Channel 37. A new ban on such stations took effect at the beginning of 1974 and was made permanent by a number of later FCC actions. As a result of this and similar actions by the Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunications Commission, Channel 37 has never been used by any over-the-air television station in Canada or the United States as a physical channel. At this point, however, some of you cannot help but wonder, but what about the aliens brought up at the beginning of the discussion? They have a lot to do with this, because it is true that the assignment of television channel 37 to radio astronomy is due to the need for astronomers to have regularly spaced spectrum bands in which to make observations, and also their stubbornness in pursuing their demands. But another factor must be taken into account. In favor of the astronomers, there was in fact a strong and unexpected movement of opinion by a large part of the population, which although knowing little about the scientific purposes of that new and difficult branch of astronomy, was clearly in favor of the need to grant to the astronomers a portion of the electromagnetic spectrum all for them. Even if this meant giving up a few dozen TV stations. Generic love for science? Yes, but above all, an incredible desire to know more about the mystery of life in the universe. Those were, in fact, the years when radio astronomy was mainly synonymous with Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, or the SETI program, led by the then-young Frank Drake. Aliens fascinated people even more than today, and any scientific institution that promised to search for them had to be helped at any cost. From this to spreading rumors about the mystery of Channel 37, the step was short. Soon, in fact, the generic support to the search for alien life turned into the urban legend of Channel 37 left free by the US government to allow aliens to contact the Earth whenever and however they wanted. In short, even if irrational, the aliens were perhaps the winning card for the preservation of the nascent branch of radio astronomy all over the world, since Channel 37 is still dedicated to scientific purposes in most of the technologically advanced countries.